Today I have a, a dear friend of mine who hopefully we're going to have him on the show many times in the future. Because uh, in the past 16, 17 years I've known him, uh, we've been, I've been fascinated listening to an extraordinary array of brilliant subjects that he deals with. Um, but uh, right now I just want to talk with him about uh, the law. Because I believe that so many people, especially in America, have misconceptions about the law. And so I, I'm totally for having law. I believe law and order is the, is the order of the day and that we have too much disorder and chaos. And what we need, uh, as far as I'm concerned, as far as Jordan Maxwell publicly is saying, I believe what we need to do is be better informed about the law. And, and live within the law, not breaking the law. Uh, that whole idea of breaking the law goes back to Moses, when Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the new law, and he sees the chaos that's going on, and uh, the Jews were dancing in, the, in some pagan ritual. It says in the Bible in Genesis that Moses threw down the tablets and broke the law. So well, that's where we get the concept of law breaking. <laughs> but I think it's very important for people to understand how the law works and to abide by the law. Don't go against the law. Because if you understand how the law really works, it can help you, it can protect you, and, uh, and actually it will help smooth out your life if you understand what you can and cannot do according to the law. So I'm all for law and teaching people to abide by the law. As a matter of fact, I grew up remembering my mother used to tell me, uh, what was it, um, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Well, basically, it still says that in law today. That, uh, And so that's why I want to have my friend talk with you about that. He wishes to remain anonymous, so I'm just going to call him my friend, but he's, uh, he's an expert on other subjects. But this one is like a, uh, a, a subject he's been interested in for a long time, and that is esoteric or hidden implications of laws, how they really, you know, how the concepts of certain laws develop and how our very system of laws in America have developed. So that's why I wanted to talk with him today, and then we'll be talking about some other subjects mm -hmm. later. So I'm just going to refer to him as my dear friend and uh, my friend who's interested in law. Okay, that's good enough. So tell us uh, some of your thoughts. Well, fundamentally, Jordan, and you mentioned this on one of your other shows, if you take a look at a globe, what do you see? I only see two things myself. I see land and I see water. Yep. That's so that. from that, it's very simple deductive logic that therefore there's two types of law on this planet, the law of the land and the law of the water. Yeah, makes sense. It's fundamentally what it's all about. <clears throat> so we could take it from there. Well, the law of the land is... Uh, well, in regards to the law of the water, there is a reason why they say FedEx ships you something. Yeah. They don't come to your home with the package in a sailing ship with oars no. hoisting the mainmast and swabbing <laughs> the poop deck. <laughs> yeah. But they still ship it to you. Yeah, it's called shipping department. Well, they exactly. have a shipping department. And of course, that, that gets into this whole thing of maritime admiralty law. And so now you understand why you have a citizenship, a Citizen sportsmanship, exactly. you know, a courtship, statesmanship, friendship, all kinds of words. And I had a whole list of them before, but ownership, because ship on shipping is commerce. It is commerce, and uh, the law of the sea has been brought onto the land. When you're dealing with the law of the land, that's common law. That's very technical, and with common law, you can take your time with issues in common <coughs> law because the common law is the law of the land, while on land, you can set borders on land. And they, you could put a building on land. It might be there 300, 600 years later. Try putting a border on the ocean. Yeah. I mean, it's going to wash yeah. away in a good five, ten minutes. Yeah, you're right. So all the technicalities that are involved with the common law, there's no time for that when you're on the high seas. But the law of the sea has been brought onto the land. 
And that's predicated on the fact that when these colonies were created and the states united on the American continent, as distinguished from the corporation, the foreign corporation known as the United States, states like Tennessee don't have access to the Atlantic Ocean. So competitively speaking, states like New York, Georgia, that have access to the Atlantic Ocean have an unfair advantage commercially. So the watermark was raised to about 6,200 feet, and the law of the sea was brought onto the land. So now the law of the sea is now the law in America. It's not the law of the land in America. Well, part of the reason was that United States Corporation, there had to be a way for these states united on the American continent, as distinguished from the foreign corporation called the United States, to deal with goods coming, coming on the high seas from England, Germany, France, of India. Course, of course, from around the world. And so the charter was created for that. All they can deal with, all they're authorized to do. They is to being... deal the, the United States, okay. not the states united on the American continent. See, the, the United States cannot exist without the states united on the American continent. The states united on the American continent, each of those are a separate country. Mm -hmm. They have their own legislature, their own government. Mm -hmm. they're, strictly speaking, we're not a nation. We're a confederated league of nations. That's exactly That's right. Because each yeah. state is a country. And those states can exist independently of the United States, the mm -hmm. corporation, the foreign corporation. That being said, though, that United States, that was set up, its charter was basically, it's a mechanism to deal with goods and all the issues involved with goods coming off the high seas from other countries that we're trading with. Of course. That being said, though, what that fundamentally means is all they're authorized to do is deal in maritime admiralty law, period. That's it. That's Washington, D.C. you're talking about. Exactly. Now, there's a court case out there. I don't know it off the top of my head, but someone somewhere in Colorado had a problem with the United States with uh, they built a driveway somewhere in the United States or some type of easement where the United States said you're not authorized to do that but in the court case it said this case is being brought in under the maritime and territorial jurisdiction of the United States because that's all they're authorized to operate so in. what you're saying to the audience is this that what we call the United States federal government Washington DC is only authorized to deal with maritime admiralty law. Period. 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 Commerce. 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 Big cases uh, that was uh, instrumental was the Tennessee Valley Authority case, where very precedent to hit the Supreme Court, where people had their properties and the Tennessee Valley wanted to expand, and the federal government said admiralty jurisdiction law. See? But this isn't clear to most people. No, most people don't know that. The United States federal government only has jurisdiction over maritime admiralty law of the water, law of the sea. That's all they were authorized to do right. by Period. the states. That's it. By the states. And that United States, that's referred to, I believe it's Article 1. That's the corporation Congress set up in the United States Constitution. As a business. As That's a Article one, I think it's I think it's Article One, Section Three, Clause Seventeen. That's the United States. That's not the states united on the American continent. Yeah, the it's states, not the whole it's not all the states together. United States you're talking about there is a company exactly. that was set up to Precisely. deal with maritime admiralty or issues goods issues. coming off the high seas and how right. that's going to be handled in a uniform fashion because some states have access to the oceans right some states do not so the simple way to handle that is you raise the watermark to like 6200 feet i don't know precisely what it is it could be 6700 feet but yeah. this is the basic idea and now you have a uniform set of laws across the land to handle maritime admiralty commercial activities in a uniform fashion to handle that in. But the where this gets interesting, though, is when you start looking at the 14th Amendment and you're talking about so-called U.S. citizens mm -hmm. under the so-called 14th Amendment because they're operating in a strictly maritime admiralty jurisdiction. If you had to refer to the Latin, I believe it's called Alini Juris, which means foreign to the common law. United States citizens have no access to the common law. They're not operating in that jurisdiction. Right. So what we're talking about here are two separate and distinctly different concepts. The first concept is the United States of America, which are the separate states collectively Precisely. coming together. All right. Let me make this point that in Europe, we have something called the European Union. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, and the European Union is made up of different countries, France and Italy and Spain and Precisely. Portugal, etc. But they are all come under one jurisdiction when it comes to international business. When it comes to right. business, they all operate as the EU, the European Union. Well, they had a few wars when they didn't do that. Yeah, right. A lot of people <laughs> died when they didn't do that. Yeah, and so now what we have is the European Union where all the states our different states in Europe uh, all have agreed uh, by agreement to join together for the purpose of maritime admiralty or for the purpose of doing business worldwide. Doing business. Okay. Precisely. But the point I'm making here is that France is still France. And when you leave Germany and go into France, you're in France. You're not in European Union. You're in France. And when you leave France and go into uh, England, into um, Portugal or any other country, you have left your country and you're in somebody else's country. So those countries still exist, but there's an agreement among the countries to when it comes to international business, we will use the same money and we will all protect each other and we'll all operate as one unit, but we're still separate countries. So when you're in France, you do what the French do. You don't do. A, you don't have the laws in Germany. You you live in a different country. So the point I want to make is that when you're in California, you cannot do the things that you can do in California and Florida, because each one That's of the states right. is a different operation completely, a different state, and that a uh, different state can be a country like the state of Israel. Well, the well, state of Israel. Well, each state has its own legislature. That's right. Has its own uh, governor. It has re- its own. Re- it used to be its own republic. A, repu- right. a republic, Republican form of government. That's right. That's under question now in California. This might be the what? The People's Republic of California. Now, that's something different. That's a little yeah. more along the communist model. Right. No, it is. <laughs> but but the point I'm making, and that's true, but what it also, but what the point I think. I'm being a little facetious there, Joe. No, that's but I think, it's, I think it's accurate. But, uh, but what I would say is that, uh, is what I want the audience to understand is that the European Union is one entity that the world has to deal with when you're dealing a with a federated Europe, league of nations. That's right, a federated league of nations. But each nation is still a separate sovereign nation. Precisely. And but each one is totally separate. So you can because they are in this kind of a league where they, they are agreed, sovereigns. They are sovereigns, but they yes, the, each one of the countries is a sovereign country, but they have agreed by uh, by treaty and by agreement to join together to do business with the rest of the world, we'll do it as one entity. We'll do it as one currency, currency, the euro. euro. Okay, but that doesn't mean the Germans are no longer Germans. No, no, Germany is still Germany, and France is still France, and England is still England, and you need to understand the difference because each one's a sovereign country. But we've all agreed to have the same money, and because we're doing this, we've all agreed that we can all cha- uh, inter inter interrelate to each other. We can cross borders without getting any well, trouble. Well, <laughs> U.S. citizens can do that because their social security number serves as an internal passport, That's so they right. can move freely between the borders. But strictly speaking, if each state in this uh, states united on the American continent, if they were really to take it to its ultimate logical conclusion and completely assert their sovereignty, you might need a passport to go from Arizona to California. That's right, because they're both separate states. And we say separate state of California, state of New York, there are different countries. State of North Dakota like is, is like the state of Israel. Precisely. It's, it's, we call it the state of, no, it's a country. And so the state of California is a country. And it has you, its own constitution. It actually has two constitutions. I know. Well, Germany has a constitution. That's right. Poland has a constitution. France has a constitution. That's the point. But they, they all own. agree to, to exactly. work together for the common good, as long as everybody remembers, everybody has respect for each other's sovereign countries. But you have, on certain things, you agree to work together. That's called the European Union. Well, that's what we have in today, uh, United States of America. America or to is- declare, because see, now that term gets to be purposely a little ambiguous because that serves the powers that be very well. So I like to say states united on the American continent. That's right. As that's- distinguished from United States, a foreign corporation in relation to those countries. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is that you have 48 or now 50 different countries we call states, 
but each one is a sovereign country of its own. Hawaii With is its not own beholding, government and its own constitution. Exactly, and Hawaii has nothing to do with the state of New York. You can do things in New York you cannot do in Delaware. You can do things in Michigan you cannot do in Hawaii. Precisely. Okay, so those, but all of those states have agreed to be together as one group to confront the world, but they're all separate. But there is a corporation that all of them have agreed upon to have one corporation represent them all when it comes to business on the high seas and international business, and we call that the United States federal government. So the United States right. federal government is a corporation. It's a company. And it was only chartered and given jurisdiction, a maritime admiralty jurisdiction. Period. That's all they can deal with. That's all they have to deal with, and that's all they can deal with, is just international business of the high seas in relation to all the different states collectively. We have all agreed collectively to have a corporation represent all 50 of us in international business. Precisely. And in their court cases, they will say under the uh, t- maritime and admiralty, m- the maritime and territorial jurisdiction of the United States. Right. That's, That's how what the assert- United States federal government is empowered to do is represent the 50 individual countries or states united under international maritime admiralty law. So, exactly. it, so because here's the way it works, From uh, if I'm right on this, when you have, a say, a 50-unit f- a, a condominium building in Hollywood, and there are 50 different condominiums, well, every single person that has a condominium owns that condominium. It's not, a, it's not an apartment, and it's not, a, it's not a, a welfare house where everybody comes in and sleeps. No. If you own a condominium and that 50 or one of those 50 condominiums, you are the owner. It is your property. However, you happen by chance to be living with 49 other people who also have their property in the building, and they have a right to their property, too, and that means you do not have the right to go into somebody else's condominium. You don't have that right. And you might share a lawn together. Yeah, you might share the and pool having together. And 50 you... different lawnmowers out there might be a real problem. So you delegate some of your authority Precisely. to one person. You have or one, one group. And so, therefore, the 50 different condominium owners get together and they appoint somebody on the property. Look, at you take care, and all of us will agree that you are in charge of picking out, taking out the trash and make sure the trash. We all purposely, all 50 of us, signed a paper and we agreed to allow you to clean the pool, you to make sure that the, the parking area is clean, and if any of the problems with the electricity or plumbing, you are in, you're responsible. So therefore, we own our own country. We own our own state. We own our own condo. But we have to work together because the the laundry's got to be uh, and the and the the pool's got to be clean. So we allow a company to be formed to take care of all of this for all of us. But but that company that we have formed, you don't own me. Exactly. I own you. You are there because I appointed you to take care of the pool and to clean and, and pick up the trash and do all the plumbing work. But that doesn't mean you own my country. You don't own my condo. I own my condo, but I am allowing you to represent me. So that's why We today, have a contract, and this is what you're delegated and authorized to do for right. me. And that's it. And the reason why I'm saying this is because so many Americans today think the, uh, the United States government represents represents Jehovah. It's almighty God of the universe, divinely appointed by the universal God. No, it's just a corporation. It's a company like Sears, like General Motors, like uh, like uh, Baskin and Robbins. It's just a company, a corporation, that the 50 states have agreed upon to allow it to come into being so it can represent us collectively to the world. But well, that doesn't mean you're God. Nobody appointed you to be Jesus or Christ or Buddha. They all they are put, appointed you to be a corporation to represent us. We are the power, not you. But they did that after learning the hard way under the Articles of Confederation because there was a point where uh, New Jersey and Delaware were going to go to war with each other. And then there was a lot of issues and contentions between the various states on the Articles of Confederation. And they said, you know, okay, this is going to play into the European powers' hands also well, and we're going to be in trouble. 
because we were still dealing with England and France at that time. So that's when they got, they came up through the Federalist Papers. You can read about all this, all the different problems, the different states were having, you know. And it, as I said, Delaware and New Jersey were ready to go, to go to war together. And not too long ago, they were talking about their sovereignty. There was some issue just recently between Delaware and New Jersey. Well, I mean, did, we did have a civil war in America. Oh yeah. Well, I don't know. Half the states of this of this union collectively got together, uh, uh, like a like a like a an army. They got together. The southern states all stuck together, and who are they going to war? Going to war? I mean, killing with guns. Who are they going to go against well, the northern states? We lost more people in that war than all the other wars put put together. The, the figures before were around four hundred seventy thousand. Now they're thinking it's up to seven hundred thousand. Right. So that's, that's a lot of kin happen. killing kin, especially when it's killing kin. It's killing you know, you know, it's like France and Italy and Germany and so and so getting together against Poland and and in Eastern Europe, and having a major bloody war, yeah. and within the European Union. Well, uh, if you're going to have that kind of a thing, well, one half the European Union is facing off on the other half, and they're coming together and they're going to kill each other. Well, now you've got some problems that you don't have a European Union anymore. You've got a civil war. Well, that's the same thing with the United States of America. At one time, you had the 48 states or whatever it was before. It got to be 48 states. But you had all those states. Each one's a different country. But then there came a time when half of those states decided the other half of the states uh, they have some problems with, and they're going to straighten out the problems with a gun. And so we call that a civil war within the different countries banding together against each other. And so it's very uncivil, a civil war. Well, yeah, so, extremely uncivil. Yeah. So I just wanted this because I know that so many people do not understand the federal government was not appointed by Jehovah. It was not appointed by Yahweh or, or Allah or Jesus or the Most High God. It's just a company, for God's sake. It's a company, it's a corporation under corporate law that was incorporated uh, to represent the different countries we call our our North America continent with the different 48 states. Yeah, the sovereigns created that. Yeah. The sovereign people created that. It was a mechanism for them to ease their financial transactions, so to speak. Yeah, because all the states have to be le have to be treated equal. And as you said, California, Oregon, Washington State, and all on the East Coast is unfair because we have access to the oceans. We can Precisely. do business with the whole world. But, but Tennessee, doesn't. Yeah, the majority inside North Dakota can't. Exactly. And, and Tennessee and all the rest of them, but Texas can. So, so the, to make to make sure we don't have another bloody civil war, we say, all right, I'll tell you what. Let's uh, we're all on the land, and and so commerce is of the water because money goes through our hands like water. No money is considered uh, liquid assets. So currency. Let's, that's right. Liquidity. It's a current. Liquidity. It's a liquidity. A currency. And when you're no longer an asset, you need to be liquidated. That's it. And so, therefore, we will take the law of the sea, which is maritime admiralty law of the sea, which is money, banking, and it's very unfair because those who don't have uh, access to the ocean are, are at a disadvantage. So what we'll do, theoretically, let's go and say that we're going to raise the law, the, the sea, watermark. the watermark. Exactly. We're going to raise, raise the watermark. So now uh, it goes to say over 6,000 foot watermark. That means all 48 states now are underwater. Therefore, now uh, Tennessee doesn't have to gripe, or Oregon, does, I mean, or, or, or Wyoming doesn't have to gripe because California can do business on the sea and they can't. No, no, we're all now under the law of the sea, under water. So everybody's laws are the same when we're talking money here. We're mm -hmm. talking business. Now, when you're on the land, which is when you leave California and go into Nevada, well, then that's on the land. So therefore, the, the, the law of the land is the law of the people in Nevada, which is not California. So if you're Precisely. coming from Wyoming into Nevada, understand you're in a different state. You've just left France and coming into Germany. So well, don't... there's some nice brothels in Nevada. That's not allowed in California. That's right. That's what I'm talking uh, about. Also in Germany and uh, Holland. 
you know, find the same thing. But look what's taking place right now, which is pretty instrumental with all the marijuana laws being passed in the state of Washington, Colorado, California. Yet it's still a federal crime to sell, distribute, or possess uh, yeah. these illegal Yeah, well, that's because of, on the corporations viewing it one way, but each one of the separate states has a sovereign. They have sovereign laws over themselves. Well, look at even the same-sex marriages. Same thing. You're seeing that across the board where a lot of states are allowing same-sex marriages and the government is saying no. Yeah, so. but you see, again, it goes back to the fact that the state has a right to decide for themselves what what they want. You know, the Germans have a right to decide what, what they want for Germany. Well, wait a minute. You're part of a, of a larger thing called the European Union now, so you've got to take into consideration what we think. So there's the problem. Uh, well, wait a minute. No. And there will be something now equivalent to our uh, you know, the powers of interstate commerce. And everything falls under that. That's right. So now everything in America falls under interstate commerce. Period. That's why you have a the what do they call it? The Federal Communicate, a uh, Federal Trade Commission. So if you're going to trade and make money and uh, and do trading, it all has to be done correctly, uh, uh, fairly. And so California can make a lot of money with Japan and with the open seas. We can make a lot of money with the world. But but our Oklahoma can't because they now have that. So therefore, we raise the watermark symbolically Precisely. to say that the whole country is now underwater. So now we all operate the same. And for all of us to operate the same and everybody is being taken care of and everyone's being treated fairly, we have to have a corporation, a, a central company, that will make sure no matter what happens in this country, everybody's treated the same. So we call it the United States federal government. Right, it to present a, a united front because it wouldn't do to have 50 different state legislatures each negotiating with Germany that's or exactly England right. or the British Empire. That's exactly right. So therefore, again, the point I want to make in this whole program is that the United States federal government is a creation of the 40 or 50 states, individual states, which have agreed to allow a corporation to represent them on the business, Precisely. not in my personal life, not in my bedroom, not in my personal life with my friends, but in business, Around the world, United Delegated States. Delegated certain enumerated powers, and right. that is it. Right. Now, today, of course, in the minds of Americans, Washington, D.C. represents Jehovah. It represents Yahweh, Allah, the Almighty God of the entire universe. Well, in and point of fact, as U.S. citizens, the United States government may tax U.S. US citizens right out of existence. They have the right to do that. Well, you see, that's some of the laws of the corporation that we have slipped by us that we didn't know about. Well, that was all imposed back in 1933 when the Department of Human Resources and yeah. Social Security Administration, all that was passed. I mean, prior to that, there was no uh, income tax for individuals. And that's when all these new departments, when the bank, when the corporation under went the, bankrupt. Under the Buck Act. Yep, under, under the, the Buck Act. Buck absolutely. Act. Yeah, yeah, well, see... What this means, and I'm saying this to the audience, what this means is that when the 48 states were sovereign states, but they all came together and agreed to allow a corporation to represent them internationally in business, the corporation became a very powerful entity because it represents 48 very powerful countries or 48 very powerful states or countries. But the problem is, is that now that corporation became so powerful that they began thinking, I think we represent Jehovah. We are God. We will call the whole shots on everything. That's like the, the guy who was picked at the apartment building, the condos. So everybody in the condos appointed one guy down the, downstairs on the bottom, and he's going to take care of the trash and the pool and everything. And so we pay him a little bit every month, and he's responsible to all of us. Now we get a letter uh, in, in, our, in our door, all 50 And he's wearing a scepter. And, and he he's has, wearing a, a scepter, and, and he he's got a, a uniform now. now. And he says he represents Jehovah God, the almighty God of the universe, the universal monarch of the universe. And he is now... Owner and controller and the vicar of Christ, and he owns the whole goddamn planet, period. He's the boss of all bosses. While the 50, uh, 50 owners of the condos are saying, wait a minute, where's this guy coming off with this? Yeah. I thought we, we, we hired We like to rescind that contract. Well, now that now we're going to have a civil war. That's right. Now you're going to have a real serious problem if you're going to say, wait a minute, wait, we didn't tell you to do that. 
We told you that you could take out the trash. We told you you can clean the pool and you fix the, the plumbing and you fix the electrical and you have the right and the responsibility to do all of that. We will pay you. But nobody appointed you to be goddamn Jesus Christ. Nobody said that you were Jehovah. Nobody said you owned the whole, our, our baby and our life and our, everything. But you, uh, that was your idea. We didn't tell you but that. But then the janitor slash king says, well, that's a gray area. Yeah, right. So I just wanted people to understand the United States government was not appointed by Jehovah. It was not appointed by the Jewish God or the, or the Babylonian gods or, or Yahweh or, uh, or Allah or, or, or you know, any of the other Babylonian gods. It's not appointed by the universal monarch of the universe. It's just business. It's just, it's just a company business. representing the 50 corporations or 50 well, companies called states. But now it's very big business because they have about 350 million franchisees. That's right. At least 33 million in California who pay their taxes to the Franchise Tax Board, which refer right. refers to those taxpayers as customers. That's right. So, And customers, they'll lean their account if they don't pay their taxes. Precisely. Because now you're on the citizenship. Yep. Because you are security. That's what Social Security is. There's a federal debt. Well, that debt has to be secured. When you go to a bank, you have to secure the loan with something. So there's a growing federal debt, and it needs to be secured with you. All right. Social Security. That's right. You are the security for, for the, debt. the federal debt. Precisely. And therefore, you are, I've said this on other programs, you need to understand, people listening need to understand this. General Motors is in many, many countries, not just in America. They're all over the planet, like Ford and all these other big corporations. However, everyone in any country of the world, from India, uh, it doesn't matter where, if you're working for Ford Motor Company or General Electric, in any country, you are still a, a General Electric or a Ford Motor Company employee. I don't care if you're in India or in Africa. It doesn't matter. Well, U.S. citizens must report their income no matter where they're residing. That's the what I'm saying. It's because you are a member of the corporation called U.S. It's a, it's a company, and you are a employee or a, or a member of the company. A Therefore, franchisee. You are a franchisee of a corporation. But the point I'm making here is that, that the corporation is all over the world. It's, you know, you, you could be a, a, a employee of Ford Motor Company working in, 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 in India. But you can be a Ford Motor Company employee working in, in, in Iceland. You know? Or Lake Titicaca. Yeah, right. So it doesn't matter because the bottom line is, are you being paid by Ford Motor Company? Yes, that you are a member of the corporation, period. Is that true? Right. Are yes. Are you a U.S. citizen? Uh, therefore, you're entitled to certain benefits of U.S. That's citizens. Right. Since you're entitled to those benefits, therefore, you must shoulder their burden. That's right. You are. doesn't matter where you're at. doesn't care if you're at the bottom of Lake Titicaca. Yeah. You pay. That's right. So, I mean, I understand, and so I'm not complaining about this. I'm not saying it's evil or bad. What I want to do is explain to the people for the first time what the United States government is and how the laws work for, the, for what we call our country, when it is not a country. It's 50 different countries, like in Europe, Different now countries. It's, well, yeah, now it's 50 different countries in the United States of America with franchisees called states yeah. that are distinct from states. One state has a capital S, another state has a lowercase yeah. S. We could talk. There's, there's two constitutions in California. The 1849 Constitution. Which, which is the des original. That describes the borders. And then there's a substitute constitution, the 1879 the Constitution, which does not discuss the borders. Yeah. And one's for U.S. citizens because... 14th Amendment was 1868 when U.S. citizens were created. So, yeah. of course, the 1849 Constitution couldn't really discuss much about that. That's right, because it wasn't... It, they it, didn't it, exist it, at it, that it time. didn't exist at that now, time. Now, 1879, we need another Constitution now for these new creatures coming into our our country here. That's right. That's right. So, so that's why uh, it's just important for people to, under, Americans to understand, because I know I live here. I've lived here for 72 years, and I know out there on the streets of America, virtually nobody understands how the law works and how government works. And I know, because I grew up in this country, 
uh, everybody I know understands the United States federal government to be the institution of God, almighty God in the universe, appointed the United States federal government to be God and sovereign owner of the goddamn universe and the whole world. When in point of fact, no, no, no. The question people should be asking themselves is where do they get their authority from? Period. Let's look at the law. What does the law say about the United States federal government? What does the law, the written law, say about an individual state? being a country, and individual countries are like individual uh, uh, apartments or condos. Each person has their own country, their own condo, and nobody has a right to go into that condo without the written, without permission from the owner. Well, you don't have permission to go into, uh, into Texas uh, because you're a California citizen. You don't Unless... have permission. You don't have permission to cross into, uh, into Texas. That's right. You have a you have a right to uh, you know protection from unwarranted search and seizure. But if you decide to sign a contract with the sheriff's department, basically saying I hereby authorize you to have twenty four access to my apartment any time of the day, any time you want. Well, that's different in. because now and you've that, made a contract. With, now you've with, got a contractual nexus with them. That's you just right. conceded some of your rights. That's right. But you, you did it to yourself. No one did that to you. That's right. You're the one that, that made the agreement with the sheriff to allow him to do whatever he wants, and you signed the contract. So. Now he does have a right to do that. So I'm just saying you need to understand how the law works. And the very word, and I've said this before, but I think it bears saying it again, that if you have a two-story building and you're going to put a lot of weight on the second floor, like printing presses or whatever, the smart thing to do before you go putting that kind of weight on the second floor of a building is to go downstairs on a ladder and get a building inspector with you and go up and move the ceiling tiles and look at the foundation of the floor you're going to build on. So, Because you need to understand that that floor is going to hold that kind of weight before you go building on it. So what you're doing is you're, un you're standing under the foundation to see if it's going to hold that kind of weight. When you're standing under something, gives you understanding. That's Precisely. where the word comes from. To understand means to stand under something. So don't just look at the federal government as appointed by Jesus Christ and anointed by the Pope of Rome and that God Almighty Jehovah has appointed the United States government to be the arbitrator for all life, for all animal and all life on the, on the face of the earth and throughout the whole universe. No, it's just a corporation. It's just a company. It's a corporation incorporated like, like, like General Motors and Ford Motor Company and any other corporation. Anybody can start a corporation. Well, the 48 countries or the 50 countries did that a long time ago when there wasn't 50 of them. But they, they got together and decided, well, we need to have a company that's going to look after all of us so that we can all go to one place and gripe and complain if, if, if something is not right. So they formed a corporation that will effectively guide and, and protect all of us collectively. And so we all get the same laws now. Uh, California cannot do anything that Wisconsin can't do. And so... Exactly. And so that's what the United States federal government is here to do, is to moderate and mediate and moderate for all of Americans uh, in, in relation to the rest of the world not to be Jesus Christ on earth in the almighty God Jehovah. No, it's to just represent the states when it comes to international business, maritime admiralty. But as you said, that the that what has happened over the years is that the law of the water, which is the law of money, the law of the high seas. Which operates in a very expeditious fashion as yeah. compared to the common law. And uh you know, when you start getting the issues of common law, that gums up the works for businessmen. Mm -hmm. That's right. But you, you know, might it might take years to decide on an issue. Well, when you're on the high seas, there's no time for that. You're on a raft tied together with vines and they're coming after you to pay your debt and they're gonna slice your throat like pirates, get their money, and that's it. Yeah. So that's it's, why. there's a tsunami on the way and there's a storm brewing on the ocean. There ain't no time for all the technicalities of this common law stuff. Common law is simply men sitting down looking at other men across the table 
and you did this to me, did you? Yeah, and you broke this, or you stole that? Yes. Well, I want that replaced, and I want my money back. Well, then they're going to say this, and you're going to say that, and back and forth. Well, this is between people. This is the the law of the people, the law of the land, because that's where we live on the land. And but, you have to produce the damages. Yeah, and you, i, I got to show you what my damages are, and I want you to pay me for my damages, what you did to me. However, when it comes to international business, while we all states agree, we'll let the corporation uh, represent us in business across the world. But they don't, they're not God. And so the problem is that we have now begun, Americans have been slowly but surely uh, brought into a position where they believe the United States federal government represents Jesus or Jehovah. Well, because as U.S. citizens under the 14th Amendment are of subject status. That's right. You are. You are subject to the corporation now. And you can be taxed at 100%, which is basically a bullet to the head. Yeah. Well, I mean, basically, as I if they, if they can tax you tax 100%. Tax you right out of existence. They, they can have tax the right you to do they, that. They have the right to do that because that's the way it works now is that the United States federal government has the right to tax you out of existence. As John Marshall said, the power to tax is the power to destroy. Yeah. I mean, that's what that's what the, the Supreme Courts uh, make those statements too. I mean, lawyers and people who are in commercial law know that. But you do get some benefits being a U.S. citizen. I don't know of anyone going to debtors' prisons. Oh, that's true. And I don't. And there's a lot of people driving around, eating very well, and driving nice cars, and wearing nice clothes, and going to movies, and having. Uh, you and know, they've never worked a day in their life. Yeah, right. And I'll attest to living in about 16 different countries over the years. Yeah, without a doubt, the United States is the best country on the planet. Oh, and of course, With our it freedom is. and you know, just overall, I mean, religious this is freedom, why I, freedom of speech. I mean, uh, we couldn't be doing this show if we were living in certain countries. You're right, no and, doubt uh, about it. But I think there's forces at work that are trying to change all that. Problem is, the hindrance they have is uh, people still think this way, still think they're free because they still can read these documents, like the Declaration of Independence. The other countries never really had that. That's right. You're right. This and is the first place where the people became sovereign. Well, that's, that's where, yeah, that's where the higher ups, like the Bilderbergs, are trying to take control of our political policies that change and implement a total world government. Yeah, and so if we have a world government, that means all borders are down. There will be no more borders. There'll be no more law. There will be only what the masters of the world dictate will dictate to you. Well, that. so goes human freedom, human dignity and freedom, and, and, and so goes all 50 people in, the, in that condos, all 50 condos. Forget it. You don't own the condos anymore. From here on out, we can kick you out. Now, and, uh, we yeah. should talk about why, per Lansing v. Smith, why the American people became sovereign. Yeah. Well, all right, look at We're running out of time. But let's talk about this probably the next show, because I think this is important. The bottom line is I want people to understand the United States government is a corporation. It's a company that represents the 50 uh, corporations of 50 states, like the state of Israel or Vatican State. Mm -hmm. A state could be a country. Well, we got 50 different countries. And each country has its own laws and regulations. You can do things in California you can't do in And New government York. and constitution. Yeah, different governments and different constitution for each state, or each state is a different country. But we've all allowed one, one uh, corporation to represent us all in business, not represent us to God, but in business. And so um, you need to understand the laws. And that's why I'm a very big believer in abiding by the law. Look at what the law says. Read the, read the statutes. Go to the law library and read how this stuff works. That's the bottom line on today's program. I am saying, as Jordan Maxwell, I think we should abide by the law, and everyone should abide by the law, because that's the idea in America. Nobody is above the law. Richard Nixon wasn't above the law. Nobody's above the law. We all abide by our laws. So, But the point is, you've got to understand what does the law say? How does this stuff really work? What is the United States federal government? It's a corporation. It's a company. And what is it, what is it empowered to do? And as I said last time, it's not empowered by, by Yahweh or Jehovah or Allah to be the vicar of Christ and the almighty God of the universe. It's a company. It's a corporation. It operates like any other corporation. And it represents the different countries. And we call them 
the states of the Union. Well, I mean, we have Vatican State and State of Israel. Those are states, but they're countries. They and are so country, sovereign. They are sovereign countries. They call states State of Israel, but it's still a sovereign country. Well, we have 50 states here, <clears throat> but each one's a sovereign country. I mean, if you, you know, you can do things in California you can't do in Delaware. You can do things in Texas you can't do in North Dakota, right? And so uh, each one of the states is a country. And then that's the way it was set up, and that's the way it's understood. Uh, however, there's been a lot of talk, and I've talked in the past when I, I and so many times I, I was not, and I've even said this on, on before, I'm not the world's foremost authority on anything, and I make mistakes like anybody else. <clears throat> I've talked about things in the past that I thought I understood, and point of fact, I didn't understand. I thought I did. And so I've been wrong on things that I've said. And, uh, but I don't mind that because I start off by saying I'm not the world's foremost authority on anything. So, that, I, that, now, so when people say, well, Jordan Maxwell said this is that, and it's obviously wrong. Well, I told you I'm not the world's foremost authority. I'm just an ordinary man pursuing extraordinary knowledge. Uh, I, I'm like anybody else that, uh, that's fascinated with wisdom and knowledge. I'm looking to try and help my fellow man to awaken to wisdom and knowledge and understanding of things which they have never looked at. So we're talking about law now and government. So there have been, what was it uh, that you said that some of the people were asking about? Well, yeah, we've had a lot of inquiries about U.S. citizen versus an American citizen and sovereign citizen and whatnot. I think one of the things that we should make a point of is that right now there's been such a bad rap regarding people that become sovereign citizens and whatnot. First of all, I, I really am, am uh, somewhat unhappy that I even got involved with this whole subject because, and point of fact, everyone who knows me, and if you see my earlier work in my life, I have always been uh, talking about uh, spiritual subjects, uh, theology, religion, ancient religions, uh, secret societies in world religions and that kind of thing. That's where my heart is. That's what I really want to, to talk to people about is theology and religion, spiritual subjects, <clears throat> because I find that to be absolutely fascinating. But being human, I get involved like everybody else does in the, in the, wor you know, in the everyday world. And, uh, and I see and understand, because I've been in the company of some extraordinarily brilliant people, and when I hear these, uh, these incredibly brilliant people talking about government and commerce and world law and all that kind of thing, I'm absolutely fascinated, and I realize that the public needs to, like I do, needs to actually be informed as to how the world they live in actually works. Because I didn't know, and I'm in the company of brilliant people who are talking about maritime admiralty as opposed to common law and what the difference is between federal government and state government and all that kind of thing. Well, as I said the last time, ignorance of the law is no excuse. And what I am suggesting, what Jordan Maxwell is publicly suggesting, is that everyone should learn how to abide by the law. You should understand how your how the governments work, how the state governments work, how the federal government works, how banking uh, banks work, how insurance companies work. How does the world around you actually work? Not how you thought it did, not what you thought it was doing. <clears throat> and I don't believe for a moment that there's any need for any violence or any kind of up uprising or revolution at all. There's nothing that, that's ludicrous on the face of it. What common intelligent people uh, have always done is like, you know, like Moses said to the Jewish people, to the Hebrew people, come, let us reason together. And that has been used in international politics and the United Nations have even said those words. Come, let us reason together. So what I am suggesting is that instead of being angry at government, instead of uh, having misunderstandings and seeing government as an enemy, no, the government only represents law. And the government is, a, is abiding by law. And we are supposed to abide by the same laws. So I'm suggesting that we all should be law-abiding. And, and this idea of being, <clears throat> of being sovereigns and having nothing over us at all, that's just not 
realistic any longer in the world in which we live. Well, I also think, Jordan, too, that given the Internet age, it's such a great time where the old saying, the pen is mightier than the sword. Right. I mean, there's so much power in writing your congressman or getting involved locally with your local government. <clears throat> I mean, guys, let's face it. Look at the people that we elect into office, both sides, the oh, left and the right, and the independents. And all it takes is, if you're passionate about something, to go out there, get enough signatures, try and raise some money, and well, you know, whatever maybe way go the out law and make says, a change. You know, yeah, no, make no. a change. Write your Congress people. <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I think what I really admire about Senator Rand Paul, he's out there and you know, his recent filibuster and his discussions about half the Congress people don't even read these bills. They're put in front, they're signed, yeah, you know, know, they're sponsored by uh, all kinds of special interest groups. I think one of the things that we should really write and focus on is the, the power of the special interest group and the corporations within the corporation. I mean, look at Monsanto, for example. European communities ban Monsanto. <clears throat> I know we've talked about that in the past, but these GMO foods are causing tumors in rats. You can Google the stuff and see. Oh, of course you can. And, you know, Monsanto has such a strong <coughs> lobby here in Washington. In fact, I think uh, President Obama, pre his first election, conveyed that he didn't want to have any uh, these special interests controlling. Yet there's a new Monsanto Act that just hit Washington uh, this week. And I think people should go out and write and stop this stuff. I mean, these genetically modified foods are not good. Well, yeah. And, and so well, I... Uh, but as Lord, <coughs> what, uh, Mayor... Mayor Rothschild said, "Yeah, Mayor I don't Rothschild. care who creates the laws. It's who controls the money. Yeah, well, that's true. It's business. <laughs> and so all I'm saying is that there are laws, and uh, we've, had, uh, we've had some other people on the program before, and we're going to have another one on, uh, a lady very soon that's going to be coming on that was really good on this stuff, subject. <clears throat> but all I'm saying is that there are laws in place that we should understand how government works. You should not uh, you should not see government as the absolute rever representation of the Almighty God. Government is made up of people like you. It's a democracy. Okay, so if we are in a democracy now, we we started off in 1776 as a republic, but now we're no longer a republic. We are a democracy. Well, democracy means the will of the people, and so the people get the government they want. They get the government because it's a democracy. The, the, the major amount of people uh, vote, and whatever they decide they want, then, well, that's what they get. They get what they want. It's a democracy. So all I'm saying is that what I personally am saying publicly on the air is that I would like to see, uh, for the first time, Americans, rather than rant and raving about government and, the, and the, all the corruption and everything, we know there's corruption, <clears throat> but there are good people in Congress. There are good people in government. There are good people in the FBI and and CIA. There are good people all over in, in government. Yeah, okay, so there is a corruption. There's corruption everywhere. But mostly it's because the people of America, the citizens of the uh, of the 50 states themselves are not very well informed. They're not very well read. They don't know what the laws say. They don't know how government works. They don't know the difference between a state government, a federal government, or, or, a, or a bag of iced tea. They don't understand any of it. They don't know. All they know is they just pay the bills and, and watch basketball. So I'm saying that this is one of the things I wanted to do at my program is to bring people face-to-face -face with experts who know all of this dark mystery that we call life and government and how commerce works and how the banks work. And so that's why I'm bringing back my friend uh, from the last, uh, from some of the other shows we've done on this subject of, of government. So the big, the idea is I don't think that this idea of sovereignty of individuals, I don't think it's uh, workable in today's world, given the understanding of where we are on, on the stream of time, the, the whole world has changed. We know that. The entire earth has changed. So I think what we need to do, rather than talk about guns and, and, and getting back and taking back and all that, I think what we should do is start looking at the law, understand how the laws work. Because I'm telling you, I have found out for myself that so much of what I thought was going on in government was, in fact, not happening. In fact, the government has there there are laws in place to to uh, put people in jail for doing what they're doing. If they're doing something uh, illegal in government, you can go to jail for that. 
So I'm just saying it's an interesting idea to, for the first time, look at how the like like our friend Sharon said, uh, our, our lady friend who was a, a real whiz on law. She says, don't come to me unless you have the law book in your hand and can quote the law from the book. Go by the book. Well, that's what Americans don't do. We don't have a book. We don't, we don't read anything. All we know is we get mad because, uh, because of something going on in the community or the cops gave you a ticket or there seems to be a lot of, of uh, oppression by government. But go back to the law book and see what the laws actually have to say and abide by the law. I think that's the safest thing for Americans to do today in the world in which we live is abide by the law. And, and, and the law can protect you and the law will protect you uh, if you know what the law says. So that's what I'm trying to do with this program, make people aware of where things come from. So let's get back to this idea of the sovereignty of individuals and all of that. And maybe you, I can have my friend again talk to us about the different kinds of citizenships. There was a federal citizenship. There's a state citizenship. I mean, these things are actually in the law. You can go to a law library and look up state citizen. And there is such a, a phenomena in America as, as a state citizen. And that, and if, But if you're a state citizen, then you're not under the federal citizenship. So you need to understand the difference. Well, the guy I've got with me right now has done both. He has been a state citizen. In fact, I want him to talk a little bit about state citizen in relation to a federal citizen and what the differences are and maybe go into this stuff. This is why I love hearing. And one quick comment on your previous commentary, Jordan. The contract makes the law. Right. That is in the law book. It says that the contract makes the law. Whatever you put in that contract and you both signed it, that's the law. That's the law. You so. signed it, and you agreed to it, and he signed it, and he agreed to it. And so any problems between the two of you, that contract is the bottom line. It doesn't matter what you think about him or he thinks about you. What is in the contract that you signed? And you can contract away uh, things that are constitutionally secured to you. That's exactly you right. You have a right, or you used to, to basically uh, there shall be no unwarranted search and seizure. But if you go down to the sheriff's department and you make a contract with the sheriff saying, I hereby, let's make a deal. I give you 24-7 <laughs> access to my home. That's right. And I'm saying it. You've just, you super, the you've just superseded your constitutional secured right. But you had the you had the right to do that. Precisely. You had the right to give away your rights if you want. Sign it away. Then sign it away if you want to. And therefore, now when the sheriff comes in and knocks on your door and doesn't even knock and just comes in, and you want to cry and complain, no, no, no. You the got a contract, contract. You have a contract, and you signed the contract saying that he could do that. So he's and not sometimes the law. some contracts are implied, like when you go to a restaurant, when you walk in there and you order food, it, there's a contract, and it's implied that you shall pay the bill, too. That's exactly right. It's called, in law, an implied contract. Yeah, when you walk into a restaurant, the people there in the restaurant assume you're going to pay the bill. You didn't come in here with broke. You didn't sign anything either. No, you didn't sign anything. You but walk You walk through the door. That's right. You walk through the door, and especially when you sat down and ordered... That's a contract. And that contract, just, it was implied, and it adhered to you as soon as you started putting food in your mouth. That's right. That's exactly right. It's an implied contract. So that's very important. The contract yeah. makes the law. Right. I mean, so you talk to your girlfriend, and you want to go steady, and she agrees. And then she's going out a couple of days later with a new guy, and you, and you think, wait a minute, I thought it was implied. I mean, we didn't have anything signed, but I thought we understood each other. Now I'm seeing that, uh, you know, you, you're not applying. You're not going by the implications of what we talked about. You said you were going to study with me. And now you're going with some other guy. So it's an implied contract. Certain things are just implied. <clears throat> and, uh, and we were discussing U.S. citizenship before we get into the distinction between state and federal yeah. citizenship. There are some nice benefits to federal citizenship. Oh. I don't know of anyone going to debtor's prisons anymore. People want, talk about they want to uh, go back to gold and silver. Well, if you're using gold and silver and you were a state citizen, you don't pay your debt, you might find yourself in a debtor's prison. That's right. That is so, exactly right. You that, can go to prison for not paying your debts if you were... <clears throat> if you are under the old uh, uh, under the old arrangement 
But yeah. under this new arrangement of a federal citizen, you cannot be put in jail just for... I don't know of anyone going to jail for debt lately. No? Now, and there's another nice benefit, too. You're in a, you're in a limited liability maritime admiralty jurisdiction. That's why you're not going to jail. You have limited liability around your debts. You don't, you know, the bill collectors call, you don't pay. But they're not coming after you to put you in debtor's prison. No, to put you in jail and prison. That's a nice benefit of being a U.S. citizen. Yeah. Limited liability, don't go to jail because you're using <laughs> their funny money. And and also uh, look at the way Americans live. Americans, generally speaking, the regular normal Americans today in this country live far, far better than royalty ever lived in Europe. True. We got beautiful new cars. I mean, a poor working class guy guy down there got bought a brand new car, and uh, and the, and the, took the family to Disneyland and uh, and took a vacation. And people, uh, you know, have uh, just the common ordinary people live pretty good. They got uh, running water. The kings in, in in Europe didn't have that. They got hot and cold running water and showers. Heat in the bathroom. The yeah. toilet seat's warm. <clears throat> you have a toilet. It's not an outhouse. And yeah. it flushes. Yeah, and also they got TV and, and entertainment and movies and cold beer. And so, I mean, what do you want here? I mean, uh, the system may be corrupt in places. Yeah, well, I know, but the whole, that, that's human. That's to be human. But the problem, but the point is I'm making is that you live pretty good here in America. Try try going to other countries, uh, you know, and look for the services. They don't even wash their hands. And like Paul Harvey said, one one half of the world doesn't even eat with forks. Exactly. What so, you're drinking downstream is what they're flushing upstream. That's right. I mean, I was all over. I've been all around the world. I know I, I've seen this, you know. So we have laws here for dietary laws and, and, and um uh, for clean, you know, for sanitation, uh, uh, sanitation laws, etc. But also we have lights. I mean, my God, you go to some country where they don't have uh, lights uh, on the street lights, and there's no laws of governing the traffic. I've been there; it's incredible. Yeah. There are no laws, and, and and I was told in 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 Egypt, do not if you're driving a car, do not ever look another driver in the face ever. Do not do not connect eyes. Don't look at another driver. Just look at the car, look at the street, but do not look at a driver. Why? And they tell me, the, the cab drivers will say, well, that's the way we, we operate here. And I said, why? And they said, because if you look at somebody, you have to agree that you saw them. But if I didn't look at you, I didn't see you. I'm sorry if I ran over you. It's your problem. I didn't see you. <laughs> why didn't you see me? I was a big truck and you didn't see me. No, I didn't see you. Huh. Why? Because I was looking at the street. I didn't see you. So I'm sorry if, if I ran over you. But here, no, we have laws and regulations that regulate traffic, and we regulate you cannot harm other people and steal from other people. And so that's a benefit. Can, those are benefits of the corporation. It's a benefit of, of our government. So I'm not complaining about government. I think, it's a, I think it's a wonderful idea that we've got a civilized government. And like we've said on the, in the, in the things, all right, so if there are, in, uh, if there are oppressions and, and inconsistencies or whatever, so... Do something about it. Go read the law. Go get the law book and read it and do something about it then. Well, the, 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 the whole <laughs> premise of the basis of this one was people talking about being an American national. I'm of the opinion there is no such thing as an American yeah, national. Yeah, I know. What I've used that, that term myself. And, it, and, and, and in point of fact, I don't think there is, in fact, that legal term exists. And I've used it myself. I mean, a Canadian's an American, uh, somebody in uh, Pennsylvania's an American, somebody in South America's an American. Yeah. Now, California being a country with a constitution of 1849 that describes borders, California is a country, Pennsylvania is a country, you could be a California national. Yeah, yeah, right. And that's what people would have been before the 14th Amendment, because this thing called a U.S. citizen did not exist until 1868 when the so-called 14th Amendment came into being. Yes. Now, I say so-called 14th Amendment because the Utah Supreme Court said no one in their right mind would look at the emotional distress the nation was under when this amendment was allegedly ratified and say that this thing's lawful. But we will not address that now. Yeah. And but I think that that's is the Utah I think State that's said that. Utah Supreme Court, I think it was around 1968 when they were dealing with all the issues around Brown Brown versus Board of Education, something along those lines. And I think that court, I may be wrong here, but I think it's Diet v. Turner. And basically it said what again? It's basically saying no one in their right mind, I'm paraphrasing, but would say that this amendment 
look at the circumstances of how this so-called 14th Amendment was ratified. It was ratified at the point of a bayonet when the um, when the nation was in a time of turmoil and emotional distress after a civil war. Right. But they said, we're not going to address the constitutionality of this amendment at this time. Yeah. But that's when this thing called U.S. citizens began to exist. That is under the 14th Amendment. So before Prior that, to before that, there, that were no, there was no such thing as anything called a U.S. citizen. That's right. You Did were not either. exist. That's right. You were a state citizen. Exactly. Uh, ben Franklin <laughs> would have been a citizen of Pennsylvania. He right. could not have been a U.S. citizen because there was no 14th Amendment in Ben Franklin's time. He was right. dead That's right. when it came into being. So therefore... He could not be a U.S. citizen. They didn't exist till 1868 under the 14th Amendment. So he had to be a citizen of Pennsylvania. Right. Mm -hmm. George Washington. There was no 14th Amendment at his time. He was a citizen of Virginia. Same thing with Thomas Jefferson. So when you look at the letters of Washington and he's speaking of his country, he's not speaking of America. The United the United no, he's speaking about Virginia. Now, Period. there's another court case, I forget the name of it, but the, the judges do say, they say, strictly speaking, we are not a nation. We are a society. And that falls in line with what we were saying in the other show. This is a confederated league of nations. And I believe George Bernard Shaw said that because he understood. Mm -hmm. So this is really a society. So this whole thing with the, uh, there's the whole issue around the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. One nation under God and to the republic. Strictly speaking, if you look at the history around that and who created that, that strictly that speaking is not correct. Bellamy. That was the Bellamy brothers. Right. And that's that, that ties into a socialist movement. That's it. That was a socialist, uh, what we would call communist, a socialist uh, guy named Bellamy. Uh, and he was the one that came up with the idea for the socialist movement and the uh, United Socialist Movement. And, and came up with the idea for the Pledge of Allegiance. That was a socialist thing. That wasn't American. And Washington, D.C. is a municipality. So it's not a republic. It's a legislative democracy. That's what D.C. is. But every state was guaranteed a republican form of government. But now you have two states. You have California state and the state of California, and they are legally distinct. The state of California... That's where U.S. citizens being franchisees of the federal government pay their taxes to. Now, California state, that has borders. Mm -hmm. So the, of, I've said that the world of difference between California state and the state of California. Right. Two Stri different things. Strictly speaking, the state of California would be a territory, military enclave. That's what that would be, an administrative district. That's legally distinct from California state. That has borders. That is dirt. Yeah. State of California is a legal fiction. It's an overlay over top of the land. It's transparent. It's a legal fiction. You can't hold it in your hands. State of Ca California state, as described in the 1849 Constitution, that's a country with borders described in that Constitution. Mm -hmm. And that was 1849, before the 14th Amendment. Yeah, after the 14th Amendment, now we got a corporation. Uh, now, Precisely. And then in California, someone came up with a constitution. The history around that's not cl quite clear, but it's the 1879 constitution because someone knew. Well, we're going to have United States citizens coming into this territory now. Well, I was a state at that time. Mm -hmm. So you have two constitutions, 1879, which is described as a substitute constitution, and the 1849, which describes the borders and the 1879 does not. So someone wanting to be a state citizen, and state citizenship does exist. Anyone out there in the public can go to Google Scholar, look up a court case. It's a 1993 court case, Jones v. Temer. And there's a footnote where the judge discusses the distinction between state citizenship and federal citizenship. And federal citizens have no access whatsoever. It says it right in there to the Bill of Rights. It does not apply to them. That's a foreign jurisdiction. That's Bill right. of Rights was created to keep the federal government off, out off the state citizens' backs, basically. But if you're a citizen of the federal government, if you're a franchisee of the federal government, logically, why would the Bill of Rights apply to you? It does not. No. Now, what they did, they brought... That's the Bill of Rights. But under Title 42, they incorporated some of those things for United States citizens, but they are not rights. They are privileges. Mm -hmm. Privileges. Privileges. 
And that's one thing. United States citizens were not guaranteed a jury trial until 1966. So as a state citizen, that's a right. And that's another thing people need to understand, too. There is no constitutionally guaranteed rights. The Constitution secures your rights. Your rights come from God. Now, the state's government didn't give me the right to breathe. I got that from God. That's who I got that from. And the Constitution recognizes that, hopefully secures that. Mm -hmm. Secures that right for me to breathe. So no one can put a lien on my breathing and tax me for it because I have a right to it. Yeah, because a right implies a right. and, and uh, but You're harming no one if I breathe. Right. But the point is that uh, this is why I've said you know, years ago, the Statue of Liberty is not the Statue of Freedom. Precisely. The Statue of Liberty, liberty is what a sailor gets when he pulls into port on a ship. He yeah, doesn't you, have freedom. You're He's coming a, back when I say you're coming that's back. That's right. You ask, you're not free to go. That's right. You ask the captain if you can leave this ship because when it pulls into port, you don't go nowhere unless you ask the captain first. And therefore, you don't have freedom. But if he says you can go for a couple of days, then he's giving you liberty. This is what sailors get, liberty, not freedom. And I think that's what kings would grant to their subjects. They would grant them a liberty, which is just another word for a privilege. Yeah. That's not a right. No, no, you don't a have a right, right. you get from God. Exactly. So I am the king, and you ask me if, I, if you want to do something I have the right as a king and a sovereign to tell you no, but I like you, so I'll let you do that. But that doesn't mean you have a right to it. That just means you check with me first. And if I say it's okay, then it's okay. It's a privilege. I give you the privilege. And that's why my mother used to say, you don't take privileges and you don't take rights you don't have. You know, you, you ask permission. You just don't walk in and take up something and walk out. And if you want to borrow the car, you don't just go out and get in the car and drive off. No, you ask your parent if you can use the car. And if they say no, then that means no. But if they if they let you, it means they're giving you a privilege to drive it. You well, don't that, have a right. That gets into the issue of government and the doctrine of parens patria. That's exactly right. The government right. is the father of the people. Yeah, there is an actual law. Talked about that. There is an actual. That's a law. doctrine. The doctrine of uh, what I say, uh, parens patria, where the government is you know basically the over the overseer, the father, you know, the authority figure. I mean, that's required for people who are incompetent. No, that's true. That's exactly why it's there, because uh, because the world realized, uh, the people in power realize that so many people are incompetent. They don't read. They don't study. They don't know. They, all they're doing is drinking their beer and watching basketball. So somebody has to regulate the uh, you know civilization. Somebody's got to regulate it. And since people are not normally self-regulating, you know, they're not like George Washington or Ben Franklin or people who were highly educated and highly moral and intelligent or, or and and you know could regulate their own va values, etc. But most people are can't be uh, trusted to do anything right because they're they're not interested in what's right and moral ethical. Wow. So you've got to you got to put some laws around them because they're not going to do it themselves. So you got to regulate I think the them. founding fathers recognized that. I mean, we get this impression that they were angels from on high to grant freedom to all mankind. That's not the case. They were a lot of them are basically fundamentally aristocrats. Yeah. But they were afraid of political coups and such, so they wanted to disperse the power among the people. I don't think it was necessarily out of the goodness of their hearts. No. It was protecting their interests the way they wanted to do business. They got tired of all the corruption with monarchies and nobilities. Yeah. You know. Coming from Europe. Yeah. Coming from Europe. Yeah, that system just did not work. Yeah. Now, that gets into the issue of why state citizens, sometimes people talk about state citizenship and they talk about that being a sovereign citizen. I think that gets into a technicality involving the Revolutionary War. I'm, an, I'm just like you, Jordan. I'm just an ordinary guy who stumbled into this stuff despite myself. So my theory at this time is uh, after the Revolutionary War was won, uh, normally in a European country, it would be one sovereign versus another sovereign. Yeah. And then just by operation of law, when one sovereign was vanquished, his sovereignty would transfer to the other sovereign. It's like if I buy a car off of you, just operational law. I hand you the cash and then automatically the ownership transfers to me. That's right. Okay, well, we 
the king of England was defeated in the American Revolution. Well, there was no monarch for the sovereignty to go to. It had to go somewhere just by operation of law. So by default, it went to the people because there were people at that time who wanted to make Washington a king. They wanted a monarchy. And that's probably some of the people around Alexander Hamilton and everything that was going on with the uh, Bank of the United States. Yeah, yeah. See, But this is all speculative because I don't have personal knowledge of this. I wasn't there. But I don't think it was necessarily some philosophical epiphany. Let's make everybody free. Because look what happened to the slaves. I mean, slavery is right in our Constitution. It's an organic part of our law. And that gets into, what, Chisholm versus Georgia or a Dred Scott decision? That still has not been overturned. They said, hey, you know, you can't really be like a white man in this country because it's unjust. It's unfair. We recognize that as judges, but your people came over here as property. And chattel, movable property, does not have rights. So, you know, there's a lot going on here. Yeah. A lot of issues. Yeah, go back over that. That's interesting that the that the that you're talking about the black in relation to the white population. Well, that's three-fifths <laughs> of all other persons. It's right there in the Constitution prior to the 14th Amendment. I mean, it's, it's embedded in the, the organic law of this country. That's the supreme law is the Constitution. I mean, if something's unconstitutional or ruled unconstitutional, it's not law. And so explain to me again, then, in relation to the Constitution about the black and white su subject, well, the Dred Scott decision, it still has not been overturned because they're saying the fact of the matter is even though it's unjust, it's in, inhumane when you read that decision, I believe it's the Dred Scott decision. Uh, they say the fact of the matter is the way things operated, your ancestors came here as chattel property and chattel property doesn't have rights. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's true because, uh, and I've said that too, that when blacks came over here originally, they were brought here under an act of war they were referred to as chattel property, chattel. There's actually books Movable written, chattel, yeah. Movable chattel, not cattle, chattel. Very close to cattle. Though. That's right, but that's where it came from, is from cattle. But they call humans chattel. And so we are chattel property, and because you can walk from one place to another, it's refer in law, humans are referred to, uh, those, those humans which are slaves are referred to as movable chattel. Human resources. A human resource. Look at the statutes. It'll talk about a product of human conception. Product of human conception. There you go. Um, moving chattel property. Human resources. Permanent, a human resource. Permanent revenue base. That's right. That's what the law calls people, a permanent revenue base. And speaking of walking, <clears throat> that also falls under interstate commerce as foot traffic. That's okay. not traveling, that's traffic. That's a commercial term. Foot traffic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just think that's fascinating when you start breaking down the words and what the law actually says, not what you think it says. Well, a traf a, a, the stern on the ship is represented by a green light, and then the port is represented by a red light. So what does that mean when you're on your streets and you see... Green means go and left means stop. You're a maritime admiralty and a vessel. That's right. And the water inside of you we call blood. It goes through a blood vessel. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's fascinating the way laws are, are, I call them, I call it occult law. Occult simply means hidden. Well, a mutual friend you and I both had said, you'll, you'll have a very difficult time ever discovering the real presumptions under the law. Yeah. And uh, I think this is what Jordan's doing here. Yeah. Very the, difficult presumptions under the law. Discovering the real presumptions under the law. Right. Well, that's, I think, one of the reasons why we want to have uh, a lot of these legal discussions and legal panels where in future episodes we will be providing actual state, federal, and international laws that people can look up and realize this is the law. Well, in regards to that with lawyers, I've had discussions like this with lawyers. And when I have copies of uh, people I know, their birth certificates, one in particular, well, I'm not going to mention where it's from, but it's from California. But on the bottom of it, it says Department of Commerce. And when you show that to a lawyer, they're shocked. 
They don't understand why the judge ruled against them. I'm a lawyer. I went to law school. I'm smart. I know something. Oh, yeah. Well, explain to me why that birth certificate says Department of Commerce there. What does that mean? Yeah, what, jur- that. what jurisdiction are you really in when you're bringing this co- your, your case for your defendant in the court? What jurisdiction do you think you're in and what jurisdiction are you actually in? And why can that judge do what he's doing and rule against you the way he is? And you just think that's so unfair. It's not unfair. No, if you understand what the law says. But then again, you know, I think that also gets into a lot of times when you're going to law school. Not that I'm qualified to say, Jordan, I'm in exactly your position. I'm just an average guy. I stumbled into all this stuff despite myself. I did not want to know these things. But circumstances forces me to learn them. So that being said, <clears throat> but I think with law school, you're learning a lot of procedure. You're not learning the presumptions under the law or the law, you're learning a lot of procedure. I've been saying that for years. That When you go to law school, you do not learn law or uh, you're learning procedure. procedure. So when you go to a law school and get and get a diploma and you, you are now a lawyer, what you have done is you've got a work permit. You have, uh, you, you do not, you're not learning the law, you're learning procedure. For instance, if you're going to work at General Motors and, and putting an engine together, uh, they will teach you. You'll go to a night class and then teach you how to put this engine together and what size screws go where and what. And so if you pass the test and you are now a mechanic, you now have a job. And so you go to work at the, at the corporation and you do your job and you know how the, wor- how the engine works and what your job is to put it together. But nobody uh, asks you to go into the head office and, and see what the corporation is doing around the world. That's none of your business. But you are a human resource, and when you're no longer necessary, your position will be liquidated. That's it. Very simple. So, therefore, as a lawyer, uh, what you're doing is you're learning how to operate within that that system, that law, lawful system. You learn what words to use, how to I know it's like a game. I mean, basically, it is a game in a court. You play basketball and tennis on a court. How do you play tennis on a court? You play with a racket. I mean, so once you understand how the law works, you'll realize that lawyers do not learn law. They do not learn the presumptions of where these laws have come from, what was the basis for the law, where, where did it come from, and why why, why do we have this law? And who All decides the, what shall be taught, that's which is right. in the interest of corporate America, because you know, if little old ladies from Missouri start gumming up the works by defending their rights under common law, and you want to take their property because you know your corporation is going to make a lot of money, and they're holding that property elodially, Little old ladies and families of no consequence can really gum up the corporate works. Especially, Can't have that. That's right. Can't Especially have that. If, if they own the property allodial. That's A-L-L-O-D-I-A-L. Precisely. Allodial title. You better go look that one up. Exactly. That's serious stuff. Allodial title. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I guess we're running out of time again, but uh, we'll be getting back to this for sure. But the bottom line on this, as far as I'm concerned, is I just think that people should awaken themselves to the law and and read what the law says and understand how our laws work, and therefore you won't be a lawbreaker, and you're not going to get in trouble with the government and with the law if you understand how it works. And if you go to jail... 99% 99% of the time, you put yourself there. That's right, because you didn't know how the law works. You didn't read. You didn't study it. Right. So learn how the law works. Don't fight the law. Live, with, uh, live in the law. Live under the law, but live knowledgeably on how the law works. And I'm not the most knowledgeable person on any of this at all. But Myself I, either. Yeah. I'm not a lawyer. No, I'm not either. But I do know enough to understand understand the law. You know, do the best you can to read and study the law. And there is a lot of different uh, things we will be helping people to go to, uh, you know, links and things that will help you. Well, that's but the, yeah, I'm the, fascinated the, by the law and how it really works. So I'm not saying the laws are evil or bad. I'm just saying it's you need to stand under the concept, understand what the law says. And for the next show, may I make one more further comment? I believe it was Oliver Wendell Holmes who said, the law allows a certain amount of oppression to exist because it exists in nature. 
So, and the and, truth will set you free. And the truth will set you free. But if you if you're not knowledgeable enough or have the will or the fortitude to exercise your rights, the law can't help you. Well, that's a that's a maximum in Roman law. There's an actual Roman maximum in law that says in Rome, if you do not defend your right, you have none. If you sleep on your rights, you have none. That's, that's it. That's correct. And the other thing, the other maxim I really like in Roman law that says. For he who would be deceived, let him. Exactly. And a lot of people are very happy being deceived. Yeah. So they don't want to hear all this happy horse crap. No, they don't want to hear all this bo- about the law and all that stuff. All they want to know is that the Dodgers are playing and drink beer until they get stopped by the police, until they get st- into court. And now they're scared. Now they need to get an attorney. And they do need an attorney, which that basically makes them a ward of the court. A ward of the court. And a ward of the court is someone of an unsound mind. That's in the law. So That's an you, American, uh, what is it? Cor- corpus, ju- cor- corpus Juris Secundum says that. It's it American says, law yeah. says. If you hire an attorney, you are a ward of the court. That's what the law says. And a ward is a infant or person of unsound mind. That's right. Well, that's verify right. that with the reference work. That's it. Uh, that's why babies are in a ward. So you've got to be out of your freaking mind to get a lawyer. <laughs> well, but that's what it's saying, is that if you, <laughs> if you understood the law, you wouldn't have gotten in trouble to start with. Exactly. Well, the jails are full of a lot of uh, innocent people, that's for sure. Well, yeah, but, we'll but you know, pe- innocent people didn't know the law. They don't know how to read the law. They don't know what the law says, so and, they got in trouble. And they get in there on default automatically. Absolutely, default automatically. Who was it? Wasn't that a Supreme Court justice that said everyone in, in, in federal prisons today elected to be there? Yeah, that I, I don't know if it was Scalia or which one said that, but they said something to that effect. Yeah, that most people are in prison because they put themselves there. And that's that, right. That's that's irregardless of whatever crime was in contention. Right. It's by what they said and did and the way they did not exercise. And, their I, and I think we definitely will. You know, we've addressed that in some past issues or past stories and future stories. We need to go into how prisons are becoming such a big business here. Well, in the I United understand States. that. That's a whole different subject. Anyway, this is Jordan Maxwell. And uh, as I said, just an ordinary man pursuing extraordinary knowledge. I'm fascinated by how much I don't know. Uh, but keep keep tuned. We've got some really interesting stuff coming up for you. Very interesting. Very controversial. But I think it's an idea whose time has come to look at some of the dark stuff that's going on in our earth, and especially in our country that people are not aware of. You need to wake up understand how the law works, understand how the way your government works, and understand God, understand the universe, you need to start doing some homework. Well, Jordan, in that regard, this country, um, the people by default did become sovereigns, and there is a maximum of law that does say a nobleman should know their law in full. Well, a sovereign's above a nobleman. So, you know, if you want to be a free people, and you want to be sovereign, Per Lansing v. Smith, uh, that, that, that kind of that maxim of law does kind of say, well, you know, if you think you're something special, you should know the law in full, so that's you can protect true. your rights because right. you're going to be involved with things of consequence. That's that's what I have found. I have I have discovered. Uh, I understood certain concepts long long time ago about the difference between a federal and state citizen and all of that. But I, what I didn't understand at that time, and still don't fully understand, but, but I got a better grasp of it now, is that when you declare yourself to be a state citizen or you say that you have some kind of a special standing that other people don't, you have better know what the hell you're talking about. And you better do your homework. Because oh, yeah. I'm telling you, most of the time, you're wrong. You've already got adhesion contracts. You've already made certain contractual agreements with government a long time ago that you have forgotten about and you didn't know about. Like but when you were born and you like have a when birth you certificate. When you were born and you birth, have, birth right. certificate. Well, well, that goes into Mercier's uh, invisible contracts. Well, well that's Precisely. what I'm talking about. So if you want to talk about that you are sovereign and you have uh, sovereign rights, uh, no, you're not sovereign. And there, and and so you better go back and do your homework because you don't have what you think you do, and you may be looking for serious trouble, and that trouble could have been uh, averted if you just understood what you were talking about. And so many people today talking about this subject, including myself, I'm to- I'm totally uh, uh, guilty of that myself. 
as I'm fascinated by the concepts and the ideas. Many, 30 years ago, I heard these ideas, and I wanted to tell people about them, but I didn't really understand. I wasn't really knowledgeable on it. I just heard different people. And so I was telling, you know, on radio and talking about these subjects, but I really didn't get it. I really didn't understand, and I still don't today. But I do know that if you're going to if you're going to state to government and to the people around you that you have some special privilege and that you're something special, then you had better do your homework because you can will be doing things which are against the law and you can go to jail for it. And but I have noticed and, and it's been the same. We, we we're talking off the air and we'll talk about it on the air about the Internal Revenue Service. Every time I have a personally have a, a dealt with the internal revenue, they have always been always been polite and decent with me, and never uh, and never coercive or or challenging. They've always been very polite, and so I mean I don't care whether whether it's right or wrong or whether it's good or bad system. It doesn't matter. They're just people doing a job. That's Precisely. all they are. They're just people doing a job, but they have always been polite and courteous. And and uh, well, they're just, yeah, you as know. you said, they're there to do a job, and the taxes in the U.S. are considerably a lot less than other parts of the world. And what most people don't realize, one of the best tax havens in the world, <laughs> it's the United States. <laughs> what does that tell you? And and people are chomping at the bit to get here. Yeah, I've lived in several different countries, and I got to tell you, Los Estados Unidos, numero uno, it's yeah. the best. Yeah, I know. But we want to keep it the best. And the way you keep something uh, high and high rated is to keep it high. And the way you do, the way you keep America great is to understand how it works. Understand what America is and how it works and what the laws are. And, and this is something I know, there's no doubt in my mind, that 99% of the people in America have no idea in the world how anything really works. You have people, even in banking, who are investors and investment companies. All they know is what they know and then doing their little job of the stock market investing. But they don't understand how the world system works. They yeah. don't understand what the government, what's the difference between a state government, federal government, between corporations. Most people have no idea about any of this. And that's why we have nothing but trouble. Yep. Nothing but problems. Yeah, and I agree with you on the IRS. I've dealt with them in the past and had them <clears throat> hours and hours on the phones with correcting this or correcting that. And they've always been polite, courteous. Yeah, yeah I've listen. never had I've never had a, one of them be uh, dis, uh, discourteous or, or unkind at all. Yep. They're yep. very understanding. And they're just trying to explain to you, well, here's what the law says, and here's what we. I mean, this is you know, we're just doing a job. You know, we don't personally know you. We're just telling you what the law says. And so I can't argue with that. And you know, if you're a U.S. citizen, well, then you have to you get in certain privileges as a U.S. citizen. You well, can drive. your taxes are a form of excise tax for your corporate privileges as a U.S. citizen. They are corporations. Proof of that being in California, U.S. citizens pay their taxes to the franchise tax board. Franchise. And you have two very important benefits. Uh, you're using funny money. You will not be put in jail for, in debtor's prison. And that's a form of limited liability, which is the whole purpose of incorporating something is to enjoy the privilege of limited liability. Limited Limited liability. liability. Yeah. See, under limited liability, if you rape someone, you know, you might they might put you in a prison cell. Under the common law, they might take you behind the court after the jury finds and you, hang you and hang you. Mm hmm. That's common That's law. strict liability. That's right. Strict liability and limited Versus liability. Versus limited liability. So U.S. citizens with the income tax, it's a form of excise tax. You're paying for that corporate privilege. Yeah. And that makes sense once you begin to see how government works. Well, that's probably how the U.S. prosecutors say it when people don't want to pay their taxes. You're enjoying the benefits. Why should you not shoulder the burdens? Well, and I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, you know, if if you're enjoying the benefits of the corporation and the system as it's now set up, and you're enjoying it, you're driving a nice car, you're driving a brand new car, and your and you're regulated by reasonable rules of the road in the form of statutes. Of course, that's not to say there's you know not some corruption with traffic tickets being a f source of revenue. Yeah, well, and, but that's that's what it is. But 
all of this is all part of law. So if you think that something is, is, is unlawful, if you think that something is uh, oppressive and, and shouldn't be, well, then fine. Go home, go do the homework. Go well, into court and fight it. One of the things I think we can get into on citations, most people don't realize a citation is just a notice to appear. Precisely. And technically, uh, a notice to appear, you're appearing in front of the judge. And under the law, you're entitled to a formal written complaint that needs to be signed by the district attorney if it's an infraction of $10 or more. And well, I've gotten off of several speeding tickets that way. You know, well, going, even more precisely, to even pull you over, that's a form of arrest because your forward motion's been impeded. So well, so there should actually even be an arrest warrant. But then again, there's U.S. citizens who don't really. Well, well, hey, look up uh, Overton versus Ohio. Very good case where some people were pulled over for a expired tag. There was some racial profiling in the case. Supreme Court says, hey, officer, you had no right to pull these people over. Great case, Supreme Court. Yeah, that would be uh, probably under probable cause. Was the stop justified in the first place? Yep. But the citation, that's a you know an interesting case. Take a look at it. It is a notice to appear. And a lot of people just get charged with the offense under default. Under the laws, they have a certain time frame to respond. They don't want to deal with challenging anything. They yep. just want to pay the ticket and get it over. Yeah, and the courts, in, at least in California, they pull you in and they throw in a pro tempore judge, which isn't even a judge. They have you sign off that you agree to this lawyer in a robe requesting your relinquishing your rights, and they enter well, a plea for that. you. What is a pro tempore? Explain well, that. A pro, in the court system, at least in California, and I haven't experienced this in other states, in the civil matter for traffic and violations like that, they'll throw you into a round up the cattle with their tickets, and everybody comes in there wanting to challenge it, and they ask you to sign off. And now the first thing I've learned from the law is I'm not going to allow a pro tempore, which is a basically just a lawyer dressed as a robe, acting as a judge. I want an elected judge who's been trained, who's been elected by the people to uh, hear my case. And then technically you have rights to a trial by jury if you feel that you're entitled to that. So you let members of your peers determine the outcome of your offense. And there's a distinction between trial by jury and jury trial. That's mm -hmm. right, boy. There's a big distinction between jury trial and trial by jury. Doesn't mean the same thing at all. See, a jury trial under the common law, the jury has powers of jury nullification. Trial by jury, that judge tell you, you just decide on the facts. I'll decide the law. Yeah. That's a trial by jury. That's not a jury trial. Right. The jury different. trial, the jury can say, we don't like these laws. This guy's home free. Yeah. This law's crap. Yeah. But see, trial by jury, the judge is not going to instruct you that way. I'll rule on the law. You decide on the facts. So there is as a classic example of what I'm talking about. There's a world of difference between a trial by jury or a jury trial. It's the difference between a, a lawyer who practices in law and an attorney as a practicing at law. In law, at law. What are you talking about? There's a difference? Yeah, well, when you get married, you got in-laws. Or if you're going to court, you're going to be at law. So you need to understand how these words work in a court. Oh, absolutely. And even in California, most people don't realize under Penal Code 853, citations are a violation of a county or city ordinance, and they were repealed. This is back in 1967 under Chapter 815. So citations technically are no longer in effect in California, yet they're given out every day. So in other words, when a, a cop gives you a ticket, is that what you're talking about? Google it. You know, look it up. Go to uh, you know, Lexington Law or one of the different search engines and Google citations in California Penal Code 853. They repealed in 1967. So what are you saying? They're, they're Technically, the law said citations are no longer allowed, but they give them out every day. And we'll go into that with our, our legal experts on some of these shows. Well, that's a classic example of what I'm talking about. Well, that gets into that maxim, a reasonable custom is to be obeyed like law. Yeah, say that again because a that's a... A maxim of law, a reasonable custom is to be obeyed like law. That is so very important. I want you to say it again, but I want you to, I want to preface it. This is a very, very important concept in maxim of law, uh, a concept behind law... Say it again, but this time I want people to listen. This is a very important uh, idea that you just explained. I'm paraphrasing the maximum because I don't know if my memory is perfect on this, but it basically says a reasonable custom is to be obeyed like law. That is, in fact, true. That's exactly what goes on in the world today. Well, if you go into court 
which is a Nisi Prius court, and you're going in there as a state citizen, they're going to move against you as if you were a U.S. citizen mm -hmm. for all kinds of technical reasons. And that being said, and they're also going to be thinking, this person's being completely unreasonable because nobody's living on plantations anymore, taking their surplus goods to the market on Wednesday to trade, and they have a bunch of slaves working on their plantation. This is the 21st century here, pal. You're being very unreasonable talking about these things you know, there's a, a type of status that was George Washington had. They're not going to say that to you overtly, but that's probably what they're going to be thinking. And it's going to be, th they're probably going to be thinking in some fashion about that maximum. A reasonable custom is to be obeyed like law. And you're coming in here being highly unreasonable. We got an expedited process here. You're talking about all this common law stuff and this and that. You're gumming up the works, buddy. Yeah. But a reasonable, a reasonable custom is to be obeyed like law. Okay. That's, I mean, telling you, I'm telling you, that is, to me, one of the most important statements I've ever heard, because that's exactly how the world works, that, that Roman maxim of law, is because uh, people, if, if, you know, people, generally speaking, understand that, we, that certain things are against the law, you know, and, and you ask anybody on the street, well, can you do this? No, no, that's against the law. Ask anybody, and people will tell you, no, it's, oh, no, you can't do that. It's against the law. Then you, like Sharon, you go to a law library and get the law book and open it up and do some research for about six hours, and you finally find it and read the law, and you find out, no, that's not the law. That's not the law at all. It's totally different. You can do the certain thing that everybody in town will tell you you can't do. And so, therefore, what this maxim of law you just quoted a couple of times is saying that it's a custom of the people to believe that this is not, not that you can't do it. So, therefore, don't do it, even if it's the even if it's not the law, but if it's a reasonable custom. And people all over the city, and all over the county, and all over the state, everybody just knows that you can't do this and you can't do that. We know that. In point of fact, you can. The law says you can't, but it is accepted by everybody that you can't, so therefore you can't do it. But that gets into what the judges said about the public, taken in by first impressions, yeah. don't think very deeply, ignorant, ill-informed. No, that's exactly what, the, what it was actually written in the law book in Black's Law Dictionary. It said something to that effect. Well, one of the you, things most people also don't realize is under the uh, Sixth Amendment, there's a statute of limitations, and a lot of people under 60 days for felony, 30 days for misdemeanors, and a lot of people waive that right. Well, you know Wait. what, Mr. Prosecutor, you want to charge me with this offense? You've got 30 days or you've got 60 days to charge me with this offense, and I'm entitled to a right to a speedy trial. And most people don't realize when they hire the attorney, they waive their rights. You're screwed right there, right there on the spot well, the second you sign up. U.S. citizens have no access to the Bill of Rights. If you could, look up Jones v. Temer, Google Scholar, and then uh, just maybe do a find in the browser on Bill of Rights, and they will explain in Jones, Jones v. Temer, U.S. citizens do not have access to the Bill of Rights. U.S. citizens do not have access to the Bill of Rights. Per Jones v. Temer, period. a 1993 court case. Right. So don't go telling the police or the judge, well, I have the the, uh, 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 the Bill of Rights protects me. You don't have access to the you Bill have, of you Rights. Have very similar privileges under Title 42, which is the United States Code. But you don't have access to the Bill of Rights. No. And that gets period. Into, that gets into the gun issue. Yeah, that's a big uh, hot spot these days under federal statute versus states. Talking but, uh, Second Amendment yep. guarantees the right to keep and bear arms. U.S. citizens have no access to the Second Amendment. Per Jones v. Temer, 1993, anyone in the audience can go to Google Scholar and look that up. And then just do a find in your browser under Bill of Rights. And they'll talk about that. It will say that in uh, two or three sentences. And then it says you only have the rights that the rights that are peculiar to federal citizenship, not state citizenship. All right. So, well, I'm just saying that the U.S. citizen means that you are a franchisee of a corporation, a and foreign corporation, a foreign corporation, a District of Columbia, State of New Columbia, whatever yep. you want to call it. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, New Columbia or State of of uh, Columbia or what we call Washington, D.C. 
And if you are a U.S. citizen, that means that you are an employee or a franchisee of that corporation, which is called the United States Corporation. Like McDonald's or Burger King. Exactly. And therefore, since you are working for, and, and, and to make this simple, it's like going to work for, for Sears. When you go to work for Sears at 8 o'clock in the morning, once you are on, 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 uh, inside of Sears as an employee, you do not have rights that you have out here in the street tonight when you go home. Precisely. Because while you're in here, we're paying you, and you work for us, and we own you. You don't like that, you can leave. But if you're going to stay here, I'm the boss, not you. And I will tell you when you can go to lunch, when you can come back, what your job is, and you had better do the job that I'm telling you. Because if not, I'm going to give you the papers, and you're out of here, and you're gone. So now you don't have any privileges. You will not no longer enjoy the benefits of employment at Sears. That's right. Simple. And so if you are if you were working at Sears, and, and I say something to you, you don't like it, and you say, well, I have a constitutional right, so I have a, a, the, the... No, you sign an employment contract. That's right. You sign an employment contract that says, I'm the boss, and you work for me. Right. As long as you understand that, you're going to get along just fine, because in, in here, under, this, under the contract you sign, I am the boss for eight hours, and what I say is the boss. And therefore, exactly. you don't have any access to any rights that you have out on the street. Wait till you leave here at 5 o'clock and you're out in the street. Now you can talk about whatever rights you think Drop you have. Drop your pants right now and give but, me a urine sample. Yeah. But when boss. you're in here, you don't have the rights. I have the right. I'm your employer. I'm the boss. I'm trying to make this point that if you're a U.S. citizen, you do not have access to the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, period. Right. You're under the jurisdiction of the 14th Amendment. There's two constitutions. There's the Constitution for the states united on the American continent. That's everything prior to the 14th Amendment. And then everything from the 14th Amendment onward is the Constitution of the United States. That's it. Constitution of the United States. Which is a foreign corporation in relation to the countries called states. Right. So there's a two constitutions, the Constitution embedded of Embedded in one document. Yeah. Embedded in one document. That's interesting that there are two constitutions, one's for the United You're States. You're holding and one piece of paper. Yeah. But there's the Constitution for the states united on the American continent, 1787. And then there's the Constitution of the United States, 1868. Corporation. Foreign corporation in relation to the states. So there are two different uh, 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 two different um, constitutions operating only. in the territorial maritime jurisdiction of that United States. Yeah. So this is what people don't understand when you talk about United States. United States is a corporation. The states united on on the on the property on the land is called. The Republic is called the United States of America, but then there's a United States. That's and why uh, Obama is not the president of the, the states united on the American continent. There was one time where the president could not enter the states. He was not authorized to do that. They would throw rocks at him. So then they created the Marine Corps to protect the president. Yeah, that's what it was called. And that's why it was under maritime law. And that's why we get the word merchant marines. They were on the sea, the merchant marines. Marines were, marine has to do with the sea. And this is addressed in the United States Code um, 1746. It talks about when you take an oath. If you take an oath without the United States, then you swear on the penalty of perjury under the laws of the United States of America, because now you're without the United States. If you're within the United States, you swear under penalty of perjury. It's Section 1746, Oaths, and I do not believe that's changed. Mm. But anybody can verify that right on the Internet right now. So the bottom line is, has a world the difference between the United States and the United States of America? Totally different. One's a corporation and one's a big idea. <laughs> it goes back, and this is why I've said... Uh, that, you know, go back and watch all those old cowboy movies. That, that's a classic example. Go back and watch the old John Wayne and old, uh, you know, the old shoot 'em up cowboy movies from many years ago, Roy Roger G. Autry and all the old cowboy movies. And the cowboys ride into town. They got the guns on the hips. 
they go in the bar and have a few drinks. And they hold court right there and yeah. shoot each other when it's time to render judgment. That's right. So if they have a if, if they have a, a disagreement, the two guys can walk out in the street like the movie High Noon. Because they're sovereigns. And, right. and a sovereign's always attended by his court. A sovereign can have court in a toilet if he wants to. <laughs> as long as there's a sovereign there, there has to be a court. So these were two sovereigns, and they held court, and now they're going to execute judgment. Somebody's dying. Somebody's walking away, and someone's going in the dirt. Well, that's true. But that's the way the country was founded. That's the way feudal Europe worked. That's Each right. Each king would exercise their rights, and people would die. You trespassed on my rights, therefore we shall have a war. Now, the subjects were subjugated. They didn't have any rights. That's right. That's why the even today, and even today in England, we you know, the British people are called subjects. Why? Because they're in subjection to, to a sovereign. To a sovereign, they're in subjection, and that was the difference in America. We said we're not going to be in subjection. To well, a... that's what I'm not so sure about, George. Yeah, I don't well, know if, no, if anybody but... was that smart to realize that it was just like things were so crazy in the wild, wild west. There was no sovereign for the kings. But we just kicked. For, there was nowhere for the sovereignty to go. So by default, operation of law had to go somewhere. So it went to the people. And then the people behind the uh, United States Constitution, uh, when Patrick Henry said, I smell a rat, was probably thinking, we got a problem here. We got a bunch of damn immigrants from Europe who were peasants before. Now they're sovereign. This is this is a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you mean a peasant's going to have a lodial title to his land? A lodial. What? Yeah, look that word up, a lodial title. Uh, A-L-L-O-D-I-A-L, a lodial title. Exactly. Oh, yeah, that's a hell of a subject. Look you that have owned all the mineral rights, everything from the core of the earth to heaven above. It's all yours. It's your dominion. Yeah, a lodial title means when you buy a piece of property and you get it under a lodial title. There is no feudal overlord whatsoever. It is land. It is not real estate. This is another principle in law. Uh, a fiction can only tax a fiction. A fiction cannot tax substance. And land cannot be taxed. Now, you could see how for the banking industry, that could be a problem when mm -hmm. mortgages apply. Now, real estate's a different story. That's a legal fiction. You know, real estate can be parceled up, taxed. Yeah, property, just, property tax. Right, that's just a state, but that's just your estate. But that's not the land. That's not land. That's right. Land is substance, that's and right. a fiction cannot tax substance. So I'm only aware of one country in Europe that allowed their some of the people to hold land allodially, and that was Poland. The Polish nobles could hold their land allodially, but they elected their king. But uh, you know, in, <coughs> England, so again, in England, the queen's holding... Everything in the Commonwealth allodially, she's the only allodial landholder. Allodial. That's yeah. it. Or the monarchy. Let's not say the queen. Let's say the monarchy. Yeah. And so uh, allodial title to means land. Means you have no overlord whatsoever. It's between you and God. Yeah. That's where the church comes in. Now you've got someone who's sovereign. They own their land outright. Well, you need someone to regulate this guy's conscience. They can do whatever he wants. Yeah, he's got his own gun, his own shotgun. Remember in the old cowboy Grows movie? Grows his own food. He's got yeah. his own minerals. Got his own. He can pull his own minerals out of the earth, pull gold and silver out of the earth. Yeah, he's got his own water out there. It pumps water up so he doesn't need your water. He doesn't need your food. He doesn't need anything. And besides, the guy's got guns out there on the property. and That's his dominion. Yeah, he can protect it. That's right. He's the, he has no feudal overlords. So well, remember is. in the old cowboy movies, how many times I've seen the old Roy Roger in the cowboy movies when I was a kid? When the sheriff would come out <clears throat> on a guy's property looking to ask the guy something, and the and the guy would come out with a shotgun in the movie and say to the sheriff, "That's far enough, sheriff. Don't come any closer to my property. What are you exactly. out here for? What are you What are you out here on my property for?" And the sheriff so would say, "No, I'm just coming out to ask you a question. Just wanted to talk to you." And he said, "Well, then you back off my property, and I'll come out and talk to you. But you own my property here. You have no right to be on my property." Well, that was in America. That's an old cowboy Western movie. That's the way America operated. But today, no, no, you don't own property allodial. 
No, you can't have that old lady in Beverly Hillbilly sitting on a tremendous amount of resources. That's not in corporate America's benefit. We got that right. But we're gonna I have mean, to she's do something just about sitting that. there. She's just crocheting and knitting on a rocking chair on the porch, and there's billions of dollars worth of minerals there. Or that she's property holding alone. That, she's yeah. holding that property alodially. Yeah, and alodial means nobody can touch it. Period. Except for her descendants. That's the right of inheritance. It goes to and you want that land, kill them all. As long as there's someone there in her bloodline, that's who it's gone to. Yeah, well, that's called a lodeo title. And I know, because I've seen it done, you can buy a new car, a lodeo title. I've seen it done. I was there when it was done. And I went. Well, strictly speaking, U.S. citizens can't hold anything allodially. Nothing. They have an equitable interest in their property because they're right. in some that's type right. of. They're getting government benefits, and when you start talking about benefits, you're talking about beneficiaries. Well, trust structures have beneficiaries. That means there's a trustee, a beneficiary. So, if you and I, Jordan, if I basically want you to hold something in trust for me, I say. Uh, I've got this three-year-old kid, and I want to give you a guitar. You be the trustee, and I allow you to have title over that. Okay. Well, that the, the beneficiary of that trust still has an equitable interest in that property, even though you're holding it. He's still a beneficiary of that trust. He has an equitable interest in it, even though I granted you ownership of it. See? Yeah, so this is why today... So he's people... benefiting from the trust, from your protection of the corpus of the trust. Yeah, but right. the point being is there's a benefit. So when you hear the word benefit and beneficiary, there's a beneficiary, which means there's some type of trust structure. So strictly speaking, U.S. citizens, I'm of the opinion that they hold nothing allodially. Their teeth, their hair piece, nothing. their car, nothing. They have an equitable interest in it. They don't, have an, they don't hold it allodially. Not that's U.S. Right. citizens. Now, state citizen, that's something different. We're in the realm of substance. We're in the realm of common law. Yeah. But state citizens in the realm of common law, that's a whole different story. But if you're a U.S. citizen, you cannot hold anything allodially, from what I understand, because allodial means nobody, including God, can touch it. No you, one. You signed it all over to someone to take care of it. That's right. Under the, probably under the doctrine of parens patria. So, therefore, government, you cannot own anything allodial if you are a U.S. citizen, uh, because that's like going to work for Sears, and you can call your own shot, and you can do anything you want, and they can't touch you. No, that's not the way it worked in here. I can fire you anytime I want. No, I'm a lodial. You can't touch me. I can do anything I please. No, and no, no. You're an employee. See, I'm an employer. You're an employee. Go look that up in the dictionary. That's a master-servant relation. That means you're, that. you're on an at-will, day-to-day basis, and your labor, you didn't generate any equity in this company, pal. That's, that's right. That's it. You get the benefit of a paycheck, and that's all. And then when you, uh, the, yeah, when you the human about... resources is no longer necessary, we shall liquidate you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, uh, you brought that point up one time before in a discussion about if, if somebody comes into your company and is helping you to build a car, and they're, they're putting their expertise oh, into well, it. Oh, yeah, if you come in as a uh, state citizen... And now you're working for the, you're not strictly speaking, you're probably not going to be an employee. You're going to be, um, your labor is going to go into building that company. You might have a stake in that company where you have uh, some type of claim in the equity of that company. Like, you can't just fire me. I will see you in a common law court and take out my share of how much I helped build this organization. I wasn't, this wasn't an employer-employee relationship. This wasn't master-servant. That's right. So and Strictly speaking, you're a corporation. I'm a uh, I'm a sovereign. I'm above a corporation. You're I'm substance. You're a legal fiction. So you think you're just going to fire me? I'm going to walk away with nothing. You know. See, that's why I, that's why I think, as I've said in all the other programs, a knowledge of the law is very important. You need to understand how this stuff works you know, because well, something is a legal fiction uh, as opposed to substance. Well, when you get into a court, you better know what you're talking about. That corporation would be a resident of the state. You would be, as a state citizen, domiciled here. There's a world of difference. Yeah. Ambassadors from the United States reside in a foreign country because they're coming back to headquarters. Yeah. That's not their domicile. They're residing there. So, so if you That's say why when resident. you file a tax return, it's a resident income tax return. 
because your home base is Washington, D.C., and you're residing in California. And that's why the collection agency is called the Internal Revenue System. Precisely. It is operating only for U.S. citizens internally, for the, internally in the corporation. So if you're a, you're a member of the corporation, you're a U.S. citizen, which means you're an employee or a, or a franchisee of a, of a foreign corporation. So the corporation has its own in-house auditing department for its own employees. It's called the internal Revenue, revenue system and internal it's revenue revenue to you, revenue. You've got a um, you know a corporate jurisdiction, a private jurisdiction, a public jurisdiction. So you you've got different tell. venues: a public venue, private venue, corporate venue. So revenue revenue to revenue. Yeah. yeah, but that's why you know you hear Americans talking about you know, those, those terrible taxes uh, system and how oh, they can tax you at a hundred percent, which means you're dead. Yeah. 100% tax. If I tax you at 100%, I put a bullet in your head, I take all your property. You can't defend it. I've just taken everything you had. That's 100% taxation. You're dead. You're no longer in my way. Yeah. Power to tax is the power to destroy. Well, I mean, that's the law. That's what the mob does. We're gonna, you didn't pay your debts. We're going to tax you at 100% now. Boom. Well, look what just happened in France. If you make more than a million dollars, it's 75% tax rate. And most people don't realize, you know, look what happened in England back in the 70s. There was, a, I think, a 90% tax rate for uh, yeah. people earning. Uh, the Beatles weren't happy about that. No, or, or Mick Jagger or any of them. Exactly. That's why they're recording Exile on Main Street in southern France. <laughs> <laughs> So it's very interesting, uh, uh, internal revenue. It's for those, only those who are called U.S. citizens because a U.S. citizen is a employee or a franchisee of a company called the United States Corporation. And if you are working for that corporation, then you are a... Uh, internally, you are inside that corporation so that you are under the auspices and under the authority of an internal You're revenue. within the United States. If you were without the United States, you would Meaning be in the States state United. Citizen. You would be in the States United on the American continent, also referred to in section, section 1746 as <clears throat> under the laws of the United States of America. That's when you're without the United States. Meaning you're not in the corporation. Right. You are a state citizen yeah. and there is such a thing as a state citizen as per, opposed to a corporate citizen per jones US. per jones v timer 1993 court case you so can. before we leave this program i'll say it one more time a u.s citizen is an employee or a franchisee of a company a, a, company? a, a foreign corporation in relation to the states that's exactly what the law says therefore as a U.S. citizen, you do not have access to the uh, Bill of Rights or to many no. things that a sovereign American uh, in 1776. Because they're, they're discussing in the Bill of Rights, there's reference <coughs> to the common law. Right. Just by definition, U.S. citizens don't have access to that. None. So don't go into court. And today, in a court, and tell the tell the judge that you have certain rights and you have a constitutional right. You don't have those he's rights. He's taking silent judicial notice of the fact this clown does not know what he's talking about. Right. So that's why when you go into court, don't think that you have a right to this and you have a constitutional right. You don't have a constitutional right. You are an employee of a corporation called United States, and therefore you are subject to that regulations and rules under that corporation you're not uh you're exactly. not a state citizen you're subject to federal laws and there are national laws and there's <clears throat> federal laws and, and you're subject to every national i mean every federal law excuse me not national every federal law and the reason why is because you can drive a new car you dress pretty well. You eat pretty well. You can take the family out to. Uh, oh yeah, the United States government <coughs> takes very good care of their franchisees. Yeah. Very good care. Yeah, you you, you have a lot of benefits. You sure do. You if you limited liability is a big one. You're not going to jail for your debts. There's a lot of people out there with a lot of credit card debt. Yeah. I don't see them going to debtor's prison. That's right. I'm I'm like Jordan. I'm not the world's foremost expert on this. I'm not a lawyer, but this is what my 
you know, logic tells me. Yeah, I mean, if your house is burning down, you can call the fire department. Exactly. And, and if and if you get in a bad accident and your child is harmed or hurt, and you got to go to the uh, uh, hospital, you can go to the emergency hospital. So the U.S. corporation takes care of its of its uh, human employees. resources. It's a human resource. Exactly. Permanent revenue. Base. And that's I mean, what a lot of people forget. You know, it is the. Uh, Best place for care and things like that that hey, are out there. The it's services. just the business. If the cow, well, if I uh, look at if I own a if I own a, a farm, and my cow breaks his leg or something, I'm going to take care of it. I want to make sure he's fed and he has water, and, and he has a place to play and he has a yard, a stock yard. Well, that's what you have a yard, and so uh, you know you you take care of your cattle, you take care well, of your children, you take care of the ones you're responsible for. And that's well, what I think we're going to get into with some of these other future episodes with the law where people can figure out if there's been some wrongdoing and it, this might be some corrupt local individual. Yep. You know, we've got a way to do it. And one one quick note. Uh, this is all being said, lest anyone think state citizenship is some type of silver bullet or panacea yeah. for any legal or tax problems they're having at this time. You better if, go back and do your yeah, homework. If it was only more. that simple. It's not that simple. No, it is a very, very difficult and probably not something you want to do anyway, but it's something you should know about, that there is a difference between being a United States citizen, a corporate uh, entity. A legal fiction. A legal fiction, as opposed to a state citizen. There is such a thing as a state citizen and by law, but you better go back and do your homework because as far as I'm concerned, you don't want to do it. And your rights under state citizenship are different than your privileges you can under bet on it. U.S. citizenship. You don't have all the privileges now. All the privileges you you were having to do all the things that you normally do in your life, you can't do it anymore because you're no longer in the company. You're no longer employed by Sears. You no longer can uh, have the have all the accoutrements of, of uh, that you had of uh, of employment. Because you're in you're, the realm of strict liability. Period. Now you're on your own. And so you better go back and do your homework when you get into this subject. And I'm suggesting you uh, you don't want to do anything until you understand the law. The law is not what you think it is. And with that, we'll say goodbye and thank everybody for listening. There's a big, big difference between a U.S. citizen and a state citizen. There's a big difference between the California state and the state of California. There's a big difference in all of this, and you better wake up and find out that's why you get in trouble.